Sarah came home late again. That wasn't new. What was new, though, was the perfume, the one she never wore for me. Hey, babe, she said, her smile too casual, too comfortable for someone who'd been gone for hours without a text or a call. Work ran late. You know how it is. But I didn't know how it was. Sarah was an attorney, but even lawyers have set hours. Especially when they're supposed to be home for dinner. I glanced at the clock, 11.47 p.m. The pasta I made had congealed into a cold, sticky mess. This wasn't the first time, and lately, I'd noticed it wasn't just work that had been keeping her. There was something else. Or someone. Yeah, sure, I mumbled, pretending to scroll through my phone, but really, I was watching her every move. She tossed her bag on the counter, her phone still in her hand, like she was guarding it. Another red flag. I used to joke that she'd rather forget her wallet than her phone. Now, I wasn't so sure it was a joke. Sarah kicked off her heels and headed for the shower without another word. Normally, I'd offer to join her, but tonight I just watched her disappear down the hallway, the click of the bathroom door echoing louder than it should have. I knew something was wrong. I'd known it for a while. But tonight, I decided I wasn't going to wait around for the excuses anymore. The phone was right there. Her little lifeline to whatever, or whoever, was keeping her out so late. This time, I was going to check. My hand was shaking when I picked it up, but I didn't hesitate. The screen was locked, but I knew the code. A part of me hated that I knew it so easily, like this was what our marriage had come to secrets and snooping. But I'd been patient long enough. The screen lit up, and there it was. A string of texts, not to any work friend or her sister, like she always claimed. The messages were from someone saved under the name Chris, though the last name wasn't there. Maybe she thought I wouldn't notice if she kept it vague. Maybe she thought I wouldn't care enough to dig deeper. But I did. My stomach twisted as I scrolled through the messages. They weren't explicit, nothing that would look suspicious if you glanced at them quickly. But that's the trick, isn't it? The small details. The stuff only a husband would know to look for. Missed you today. Can't wait to see you again this weekend. A lump formed in my throat. This weekend? The one she said she was spending with her college friends? My grip tightened on the phone. This was it. I didn't need any more confirmation, but there it was, plain as day. I'll bring the wine. You bring that smile of yours, winky face. That smile. The same one she hadn't given me in months. The shower stopped running, and panic rushed through me. I slammed the phone down on the counter like it was on fire, heart pounding. What the hell was I going to do? Sarah came out a minute later, wrapped in a towel, acting like nothing was wrong. But everything was wrong. And she had no idea I knew. I knew something was off the moment I read those messages, but the reality didn't hit me until she walked into the room after her shower, completely unaware of the storm brewing in my head. She acted like nothing had changed, as if we were still the same couple we had been ten years ago. But I wasn't the same guy I was back then, and clearly, she wasn't the same woman I thought I knew. She sat down next to me on the couch, her wet hair dripping onto the cushions, still wrapped in her towel. She scrolled through her phone casually, probably deleting the latest messages from Chris. For a split second, I almost asked her about it, just blurted it out, right there. But I didn't. The words got stuck in my throat because I didn't want her to lie to my face. Not yet. Instead, I watched her. Really watched her. Long day, she asked, not even looking up. Yeah. You? Ugh, the worst. That new case is killing me. She lied so easily. Too easily. I didn't say anything, just nodded. I couldn't trust myself to speak, not without my voice shaking, not without everything boiling up to the surface. My mind was racing with the possibilities, who this guy was, how long this had been going on, whether she had ever planned to tell me at all. I got up, mumbled something about needing to go to bed, and headed for the bedroom, leaving her on the couch, still glued to her phone. Once I was in bed, the ceiling became my new best friend, staring at it in the dark, 
wondering how the hell this had become my life. You think you know someone after 10 years. You think you can trust them. But now, everything was up in the air. My marriage, my future, everything. And Sarah? She was just out there in the living room, acting like nothing was wrong. It was almost funny, in a sick way. It wasn't until I heard her footsteps coming down the hall, her phone still buzzing quietly with notifications, that I realized something. I didn't just want to know what was going on, I needed to know. The next morning, Sarah was up early. She left before me, like she had been doing more often lately. Usually, she'd kiss me goodbye, but today, she just grabbed her bag and hurried out, saying she'd see me later. And just like that, I was alone. It wasn't long before I found myself sitting at the kitchen table, staring at her phone. The texts from last night had been deleted, of course. She was careful. But not careful enough. There was still a trail of breadcrumbs, and I was about to follow it. First, I checked her contacts, no Chris. Not surprising. She wouldn't be dumb enough to leave his full name in her phone. But I remembered the messages had mentioned meeting this weekend, and that was all I needed. I scrolled through her calendar, looking for anything that might match. And there it was. Saturday. Blocked off with no details, just the word friends. I felt my chest tighten. This wasn't some random fling. This was something planned, something organized. This guy wasn't just a spur-of-the-moment hookup, he was part of her life now. Maybe even a part of her routine. I sat there for a while, trying to figure out my next move. Part of me wanted to call her out immediately, just grab the phone, head to her office, and demand answers. But that wasn't going to get me anywhere. I needed proof. Real proof. And something told me she wasn't going to make it easy. I had a plan forming in my head, but I wasn't proud of it. It wasn't the kind of thing I ever thought I'd be doing. But this wasn't the life I thought I'd be living, either. So, I did what I had to do. I started with her social media. I went through everything, her friends list, tagged photos, posts. There was nothing suspicious at first glance. But then I noticed something strange, Sarah had recently gone on a few girls trips, but there were no photos. No check-ins. Nothing. Not even a mention of where they had been or who she was with. Sarah loved posting about her life. Every vacation, every outing, it all ended up online. But these trips? These were different. It was like they had been wiped from existence. Or maybe they had never really happened at all. That's when I remembered something. Sarah had an old tablet she rarely used anymore, but it was still synced to her accounts. I found it in the drawer, powered it up, and there it was a full archive of her texts and emails, stretching back months. She hadn't bothered to clear this one out. I scrolled through the messages. And that's when I saw it. The first message from Chris was from six months ago. Nothing out of the ordinary, just a casual chat about work, something about a case she was working on. But as I kept scrolling, the conversations started to change. They got more personal. More flirtatious. Then came the photos. They weren't explicit, at least, not at first. Just a few selfies, nothing scandalous. But there was something about the way she looked at the camera, the way she smiled. It wasn't the smile she gave me. It was the kind of smile that said more than words ever could. The texts got worse. Talks of late night meetups, hotel reservations, inside jokes I didn't understand. All of it right there, staring me in the face, like a slap I never saw coming. The last message was from just a few days ago. Chris was confirming their plans for the weekend, the weekend she had told me was a girl's trip. He asked if she was still up for round two. And she replied with a simple, can't wait. It was like a punch to the gut. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. All I could do was sit there, staring at the screen, trying to wrap my head around the fact that my wife, the woman I thought I'd grow old with, was planning her next affair while lying to my face. I spent the rest of the day in a haze, unable to focus on anything but what I had found. I kept telling myself I needed more proof, something solid. 
but deep down, I knew I already had enough. I didn't need to dig any deeper, but I did anyway, because what else was I supposed to do? I went through everything old texts, emails, even her browser history. I found more messages, more details about her and Chris. Apparently, they had been seeing each other for months, meeting up whenever I was out of town or busy with work. They had a system, a routine, and I had been too blind to see it. It wasn't just the physical betrayal that hurt, it was everything. The lies, the deception, the fact that she had been living this double life right under my nose. I thought about all the times she had come home late, all the excuses she had made, all the nights we had spent together while she was texting him. It made me sick. By the time Sarah came home that night, I had already decided what I was going to do. I wasn't going to confront her right away. I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of knowing how much she had hurt me. No, I was going to wait. I was going to let her dig her own grave, and when the time was right, I would bury her in it. That night, I pretended everything was fine. I smiled, I made small talk, I even kissed her goodnight. But inside, I was planning my next move. This wasn't just about finding out the truth anymore. This was about making sure she paid for what she had done. She thought she was in control. She thought she could keep lying to me, keep sneaking around behind my back. But she was wrong. I was going to find out everything. And when I did, she wouldn't even see it coming. As I lay in bed that night, staring at the ceiling again, I knew things were never going to be the same. The marriage I thought I had was gone, replaced by something ugly and broken. But I wasn't going to be the one left picking up the pieces. Not this time. Sarah had made her bed. Now, she was going to lie in it. By the time Saturday rolled around, I was ready. Every bone in my body ached to just let loose, to scream at her, but I kept it all bottled up, waiting for the right moment. It had been one of the longest weeks of my life, acting normal around her. I couldn't even look at her without feeling the weight of those messages. Still, I played the part ate dinner with her, watched TV like nothing was wrong. But every time she smiled, every time she laughed, all I could think was, you have no idea what's coming. I had everything planned. I wasn't going to let her get away with it. I wanted to catch her in the act. Let her think she was outsmarting me while I was preparing for the moment to drop the hammer. That weekend, she had her so-called girls trip lined up. She'd mentioned it again, like it was nothing, a casual reminder. I'll be heading out around noon tomorrow, she said, tossing the comment over her shoulder while scrolling through her phone. Probably texting him, confirming the details. Should be back Sunday night. I nodded, acting uninterested, but my mind was already turning. Sounds good, I said, keeping my voice steady. Have fun. Saturday came, and she left the house exactly when she said she would, a little overnight bag slung over her shoulder. She kissed me on the cheek, like she had a million times before, like she wasn't betraying me with every step. Love you, she said, just like always. I watched her drive off. Yeah, we'll see about that. I didn't wait long after she left. I had already decided what I was going to do. The messages on her tablet had been clear she wasn't going to be with her friends. Chris was taking her to some fancy hotel downtown. I knew the place, had even driven past it a few times. She had no idea I was on to her. As far as she knew, I was just going to sit at home all weekend, waiting for her to come back with some story about how much fun she had with her friends. But I had different plans. I grabbed my jacket, my keys, and left the house. I wasn't angry. Not yet. I was cold. Methodical. I drove straight to the hotel. It wasn't far, just on the other side of town. The drive was quiet. Too quiet. My head buzzed with the details I'd been piecing together all week, and I was running over everything in my mind, making sure I hadn't missed anything. When I pulled up, I parked a block away, somewhere she wouldn't notice. Not that it mattered, I doubted she'd be looking out for me. She thought she was safe, that I was sitting at home, oblivious to what was going on. But I wasn't going to let her walk away from this without facing what she'd done. The hotel lobby was buzzing with tourists and businesspeople, the usual weekend crowd. 
No one paid any attention to me as I walked through the entrance, my eyes scanning the room for any sign of her. But I wasn't going to find her there. I already knew that. I headed straight for the elevators, punching in the floor number I'd found in one of the messages. Eighth floor. Room 817. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as the elevator doors slid shut. The ding of each floor was like a countdown in my head. 6, 7, 8. When the doors opened, I hesitated for a second, letting the quiet hallway sink in around me. There was no turning back now. Room 817 was at the far end of the hall. I took my time walking toward it, not because I was second-guessing anything, but because I wanted to savor this. The calm before the storm. When I reached the door, I stood there for a minute, listening. There were muffled voices inside. Laughter. Her laugh. I didn't even realize my hands had balled into fists until I felt my nails digging into my palms. I knocked. Not a polite tap, but hard. Three sharp raps, like I was the police coming to shut everything down. The voices inside went quiet. For a second, I thought maybe they'd ignore it, pretend no one was there. But then I heard movement. Footsteps. The door opened slowly. There she was, standing in front of me, her face draining of color the moment she saw who it was. She looked like she'd seen a ghost. Hi, Sarah, I said, my voice low, calm. Too calm. She didn't say anything, just stood there, frozen, her hand still on the doorknob. Behind her, I saw him. Chris. He was sitting on the bed, half-dressed, looking just as stunned as she did. Care to explain what's going on here? I asked, stepping into the room. Sarah snapped out of her shock, quickly stepping back as I entered. I? I can explain, she stammered, her face flushed with panic. It's not what it looks like. That phrase. The classic, pathetic defense. It's not what it looks like. I almost laughed at how ridiculous it was. She didn't even know how stupid she sounded. Not what it looks like. I repeated, stepping closer to her. I could feel my blood boiling now, the anger I'd been holding back all week finally bubbling to the surface. It looks pretty clear to me, Sarah. Chris, the guy I'd only known as a name on a screen, stood up, his hands raised like he was trying to de-escalate things. Hey man, listen. I cut him off. Shut up. He closed his mouth, his face going pale. Smart move. Sarah was scrambling for words now, like she could somehow talk her way out of this. It's just, it's complicated, okay? I didn't mean for this to happen. Didn't mean for what to happen? I shot back. You didn't mean to come here, meet this guy, lie to my face about where you were going? She didn't answer. What could she say? She was caught, plain and simple. You've been cheating on me, I said, and it wasn't a question. It was a statement. A fact. How long has this been going on? She opened her mouth to speak, but nothing came out at first. She looked at Chris, then back at me. A few months, she finally whispered, her voice barely audible. A few months, I repeated, shaking my head. It was like a weight had settled in my chest. All the trust, all the years we'd spent together, it was nothing. She'd thrown it all away, and for what? For this guy? Chris tried again, stepping forward like he was going to explain things. Look, man, we didn't mean for you to find out like this. I rounded on him before he could finish. You think I give a damn how I found out? I shouted, my voice echoing off the walls. He took a step back, hands still up like I was about to hit him. I don't care about your excuses. You knew she was married. You knew she had a husband, and you didn't care. Please, let's just talk about this, Sarah pleaded, stepping between us. We can fix this. I didn't mean for it to go this far. You didn't mean for it to go this far? I was so angry I could barely see straight. You've been sleeping with this guy behind my back for months, Sarah. What part of that didn't you mean? She was crying now, her face red, tears streaming down her cheeks. 
I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But it was too late for apologies. Way too late. I trusted you, I said, my voice shaking with anger. I gave you everything, and this is what you do. You throw it all away for, for him? I pointed at Chris, who still hadn't said another word. He just stood there, looking at the floor like a scolded child. Sarah was still crying, trying to reach out for me, but I pulled away. Please, we can work this out, she sobbed. It doesn't have to end like this. I laughed, but there was no humor in it. Work this out? Are you serious? You think we can just work this out like it's some small mistake? She wiped at her tears, struggling to find the right words. I never stopped loving you. That did it. That was the breaking point. You've got a funny way of showing it, I spat, turning toward the door. But don't worry, I'll fix this. I'll fix this for both of us. She tried to follow me, grabbing my arm as I reached the door. Please, don't leave. We can talk about this. I ripped my arm free, my voice cold and final. There's nothing left to talk about, Sarah. I'll be filing for divorce on Monday. You can explain yourself to a lawyer. And with that, I left her standing there, sobbing, while Chris stood silently by, too afraid to even look me in the eye. As I walked out of that hotel room, I knew one thing for sure, my life had changed forever, and there was no going back. But Sarah? She was about to learn just how much damage she'd really done. I didn't go straight home after leaving the hotel. My mind was racing too fast for me to just sit and do nothing. I drove around the city for a while, trying to calm myself down, trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do next. But the longer I drove, the angrier I got. It wasn't just about the cheating anymore, it was the humiliation, the betrayal. I had given her everything. I had built a life with her, trusted her, and this was how she repaid me. By the time I pulled into my driveway, a plan had already started forming in my head. I wasn't just going to let her walk away from this. She had already destroyed our marriage, and now, I was going to make sure she felt the consequences. The house was quiet when I stepped inside. Of course, it was, she wasn't home. She was still with him. For all I knew, she was still in that hotel room, crying and begging for forgiveness. But I wasn't about to forgive her. Not now. Not ever. I headed straight for the bedroom, opened the closet, and grabbed a suitcase. I wasn't packing for me, though, I was packing for her. Clothes, shoes, everything that had her name on it. I threw it all in without a second thought. There was no going back now. The next thing I did was call my lawyer. I'd known her for years, she'd handled a few cases for me when I had some legal trouble with the business, and I trusted her more than anyone else. Her name was Caroline, and she was known for being ruthless in court. I explained everything to her, from the texts I found to the confrontation at the hotel, and when I was done, she was silent for a few moments. This is a clean-cut case of adultery, she finally said. We'll have no problem filing for divorce. In fact, with the evidence you have, you should be in a good position to avoid any major financial losses. We can push for you to keep the house. That was exactly what I needed to hear. I don't care about the money, I said. I just want this over with as quickly as possible. She paused. Are you sure about that? because you're entitled to more than just the house. You could take her for alimony. Even with no kids, after ten years of marriage, she'd owe you. I thought about it for a second. Sarah had been making more money than me the past few years, with her fancy job at the law firm. I could have pushed for alimony, taken her for every penny. But that wasn't what I wanted. I wasn't interested in dragging this out. No alimony, I said but I want to make sure she can't come after me for anything. No claims on the house, no joint accounts. Caroline agreed, and we made plans to file first thing Monday morning. It was already late on Saturday, and I knew Sarah wouldn't be back until Sunday evening. That gave me just enough time to set everything in motion. Once I hung up with the lawyer, I got to work. I'd already packed her things, but there was more to do. 
I grabbed my laptop and started going through our bank accounts, credit cards, everything that had both our names on it. We had a joint savings account that was mostly her money, she'd always been the bigger saver between the two of us. That wasn't a problem. I didn't need her money. But what I wasn't about to do was let her have any access to mine. I transferred all the funds from my personal account into a new one, locking her out completely. I made sure to cancel the joint credit card as well. She'd have to pay her own way from now on. Next, I changed the locks. I wasn't even going to wait for her to come home before kicking her out. I knew it was a bit extreme, but this was my house. I wasn't going to let her sleep here, not after what she had done. If she wanted to play house with her lover, she could find somewhere else to stay. By the time I finished, it was late, but I wasn't tired. I was running on pure adrenaline. I didn't feel guilt, didn't feel any kind of second thoughts. All I felt was the need to follow through. There was one last thing I needed to do. I knew I could have waited until she got home to hand her the divorce papers, to explain to her face to face what was happening. But I didn't want to give her that chance. I didn't want her to try and talk her way out of it. So, I made one final call to her sister, Natalie. Natalie and Sarah had always been close, but she and I had never gotten along. She was one of those people who thought she knew best, always had an opinion on everything. But right now, I didn't care about that. I needed someone to take Sarah's things, and Natalie was the obvious choice. Natalie, it's Mike, I said when she picked up. I need a favor. She hesitated, clearly surprised to hear from me. What's going on? I explained the situation in the briefest way possible, Sarah had been cheating, I was filing for divorce, and I needed her to come pick up Sarah's things. She didn't argue, didn't ask for details. In fact, I got the sense she wasn't all that surprised. She just agreed to come by in the morning and hung up. Good. One less thing to worry about. The next morning, Natalie showed up bright and early, and I let her in. She didn't say much, just looked at the suitcases and nodded. I could tell she didn't want to get involved, and I didn't want her involved either. She grabbed the bags, loaded them into her car, and left without a word. I was still running on that strange, cold focus when Sarah came home later that night. I was in the kitchen, sitting at the table with a cup of coffee, waiting. I heard her key in the lock, heard the doorknob jiggle, and then, nothing. She knocked. Mike? The door's locked. I didn't answer right away. I just listened to her knock again, her voice a little more nervous this time. Mike? Are you there? Finally, I got up, walked to the door, and opened it. The look on her face when she saw me was priceless. She must have thought she'd walked into the wrong house for a second. But then it hit her, this was real. What's going on, she asked, her voice shaking. I changed the locks, I said calmly. She blinked, confused. Why would you do that? I stepped aside, letting her see the empty spaces in the house. Her suitcase was gone. Her things were gone. The reality started to sink in, and her eyes widened. What did you do? I packed your things. Natalie came by and picked them up. I'm filing for divorce tomorrow. Her face went pale. Mike, wait. No, I cut her off. There's nothing to wait for. I saw the texts, Sarah. I know everything. She looked like she was about to cry again, but this time I didn't care. Mike, please, we can talk about this. I didn't mean for it to go this far. It was a mistake. Mistake? I snapped. Sarah came home late again. That wasn't new. What was new, though, was the perfume, the one she never wore for me. Hey, babe, she said, her smile